I've assembled some of your favorite iOS development YouTubers and indies to give you a ton of helpful tips along the journey of becoming an iOS developer yourself. Hey, this is Flo. First of all, I want to thank everyone who spent time to contribute to this video. It means a lot to me and I'm sure you will also enjoy it. If you do, please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Let's get right into it with the first tip from Chris, who you might know from Code with Chris. Hey there, I'm Chris from Code with Chris, and today I'd like to share with you a few shortcuts that I use on the daily, and I think it'll make coding a lot more fast and fun. Especially if you're just starting out, take a little time to learn these shortcuts, you'll feel like a wizard in Xcode. All right, so let's dive in. The first tip is for indenting. A lot of beginners struggle with syntax errors and keeping your code tidy goes a long way to reducing errors. So no matter where your cursor is on the line, you can press command and square bracket to shift your line of code left and right. What I especially like is if your cursor is already in the beginning of the line, you can press tab and shift plus tab to do the same thing, but it's better because it only takes one hand. Another quick tip for keeping your code tidy is command A to select everything and then control I to automatically re-indent everything nicely. Next, I want to talk about editing code. So sometimes your view code gets pretty long and what I like to do to create more space is to fold the code like this. You can do this with holding command plus option and left and right. So this can create more space for you to work. Now, in terms of editing code, commenting is another common task we have to do. So no matter where your cursor is on the line, press command plus forward slash to comment that line out. You can even do this with multiple lines at once. And in case you didn't know, you can always use that forward slash asterisk and asterisk forward slash to comment out a block of code. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is navigation. Oftentimes, what will happen is as you're editing code, you're jumping through different files. For example, if I want to see where this is defined, I can right click, jump to definition. I might change something here, and I want to go back to where I was. So, what you can do is use these arrows here to navigate, but to do it quicker, if your hands are already on the keyboard, you can hold down command plus control and then left or right to navigate forward and backwards. You can also just traverse through the tabs right there by pressing command squiggly bracket, which ends up being command shift and square bracket. But I don't find this nearly as useful. I typically jump forwards and backwards rather than through these tabs sequentially. And the last tip I want to share with you is find all. So if you hold down command shift and press F, you can search across your whole project for a certain piece of text. So those are the common Xcode shortcuts that I use when I code. I hope they're useful to you. Chris brings up a few tiny tips, but they can really make a difference. Your hands are pretty much always already on the keyboard, so navigating via keyboard shortcuts naturally makes your life easier. Next up, we have a tip from Peter, who you might know as a developer advocate for Firebase, or from his own YouTube channel, Peter Friese. Thanks, Flo. So you all know that you can apply view modifiers to views and container views. For example, here are two text views inside a stack. Now, I can change the color either by applying the foreground color modifier to each of those text views, or I can move the modifier to the surrounding container like so. And now I can delete the other modifier and both labels will still use the same color. So have you ever wondered why this works? How can a view know about the property that has been set on its container view or even the parent view of the container view? Well, the answer is it's the environment. When you're using a view modifier like foreground color or font, this will be written into SwiftUI's environment and all interested views can then use this information to adjust their look and feel accordingly. That's right. I just said look and feel because you can also use this for closures. Let me show you what I mean. So here I've built a SwiftUI component that shows a text input field with a floating label. And it's also got a couple of other advanced features such as a clear button and input validation. So when I type in an email address, it will verify if this is a valid email address. But you might have noticed that this code over here is duplicated. So Let's see if we can move this to the container view. So let me quickly move the code down to the container view and then comment out this duplicate code up here. Okay, and now when I run this again, it still works as expected. So 
Let's take a quick look at why this works. So here we've got the infrastructure to fetch the validation handler from the environment. First, we use the environment values to register an environment value that can hold the closure we want to use to perform the input validation. Then we register an extension on view to allow the user to connect their validation closure to any view, not just the text input view, but any view, for example, the surrounding stack or section or whatever. And this is the reason why we're able to register the validation handler on a container view. To pull the closure from the environment, we can then use the add environment property wrapper. And finally, we use the validation handler here to validate the user input. So thanks to using the environment, we're able to configure the view either by applying the view modifier on the view itself or on one of its parent views. And that's my tip for you today. When building custom components, use the Swift UI environment to make them configurable. If you want to learn more about this, check out my YouTube channel. I've got an entire series about building reusable Swift UI components in which I walk you through the process of building this text input view step by step. Back to you, Flo. The Swift UI environment really seems like magic when you first get into iOS development. But once you understand how it works, you can leverage it to create easy to use APIs that feel right at home in Swift UI. Pit from Swift and Tips even has two tips for you. So let's get right into them next. Don't leave everything to your mind. When you have an idea for an app, a project or big task to do, sounds amazing in your head, but that brings us a lot of issues. We might forget what we thought next morning. A big task could be overwhelming and also produce you stress. You don't know where to start off. Here are some tips to keep your mind fresh. Write down all the activities you have to do daily. It is not necessary a super complex list. Only a list with tick boxes is fine. But try to use a notebook and avoid an app. The phone has a lot of distractions that might stop you from making your job. By the way, don't forget to activate the do not disturb mode. If you have to do a task, you have two options. Do it now, or if you can do it right now, then write it down in your notebook. Or if this will become a recurrent task or something that you need to do every day, try to establish that time in your calendar. Your calendar is a powerful tool to make your activities. Over engineering is a type of procrastination. If you're working in a team with hundreds of developers, making your call scalable is something really important. However, some people doing personal projects also worry so much about these on more topics, at some point that even the first release never comes, because the code is not well enough. Remember, code will never be perfect. I'm not saying don't do clean code or follow good practices. I mean, be pragmatic and iterate over time. Maybe scalability or other problems are not your priority right now. Maybe your only priority is releasing the app. Remember this simple thing, done is better than perfect. These are two great life tips, but applied to iOS development, they can really help you get started and finish your app projects faster. Personally, I like to organize all of my ideas before implementing them, so it's less likely for me to forget some features or a bug fix. With that, let's jump into a related tip from Michaela Karen, who you might know from Code with Chris, or her brand new own YouTube channel. My tip is sketch out what you want to do before you do it. So when you have some new app idea, you have to know what you're building before you can even start coding. Like, yes, you can jump in and kind of try to do something, but if you have at least a rough sketch, rough draft, whatever it is that you're going to do, just make a quick sketch of what are all the different screens and like a couple buttons, get that much done, and then you can jump into the code and it'll be a lot easier to get started. Good luck. Even if you're just working on a project by yourself, writing down and visualizing what you want to create can save you so much time and decision-making power in the end. I highly recommend at least sketching out the main screens of your app on paper or digitally before jumping into code. With SwiftUI, creating mockups can also be done in code. But if you decide to go down that route, you should remember to mock data wherever possible so you can focus on visualizing your ideas first. Let's hear what Mark from Big Mountain Studio has to say about this next. Thanks, Flo. Okay, now 
For my tip for iOS developers, I would say that when you're building or designing your app, you don't want to get too far into it. What I mean is you want to create like a minimal viable product and then share that with users. Share that with uh, the people that are going to be using the app and get feedback from them. Do you like this? Do you not like this? Or maybe add some metrics like to see how many people use the features that you have. So for example, you have this idea for an app and it has five features. So you build a couple of those features and then you share it with your users. Maybe you have a special group of beta users and then you get feedback from them. Did they like those two features? Or maybe you add metrics to them. So then you can see, uh, did they use one feature more than the other or did they use one feature not at all? That way, when you build your app, you're gonna have a way better idea of what your users need and what they want. So your idea of what they need and want may be really different from your user's idea of what they need and want. And that's the thing you're trying to prevent. You're trying to prevent doing too much work for something your audience doesn't even need and want. So it's very important when creating your app or even like starting a business or if you're going to create a video or if you're going to create a feature, you know, do the minimal amount of work possible and then get feedback. And then from there, you know, you might have to alter some of your features of your app and make it more towards something that they're really going to love and need and want. Okay, so that's my tip for you guys. Mark brings up a great point, which is getting feedback early. Apple provides you with TestFlight, a great and easy way to share beta builds of your app with other people so they can find bugs, tell you how the app feels and let you know about feature ideas. You have probably already seen a video or two from Stuart Lynch, who is the next one to bring you a super helpful Swift UI related tip. Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this app I have three views. The country view file includes a country struct with a static array of countries along with a function that will generate a random one. And there's that country view that displays the flag with the name over top. The sports view contains a similar structured sports struct along with a corresponding view. I want to be able to tap on any button to either display the corresponding view when the button is tapped or clear it. And I've got three actions all set up for that. So let me create an enum with two cases, each with an associated value, one for country and one for sport. What you might not realize though is that you can conform an enum to a view protocol, which will require a body variable of some view. And we can switch on the case then and use the associated value to pass in our specified view. In content view then, let's set up an optional state property called selected view that is of type selected view. And then before the spacer, we can specify this view. Remember, this is an enum and it's a view. And since it's nil, nothing's going to be displayed. Now for our button actions, all we have to do is specify the enum case and pass in a random object corresponding to the associated value or set it back to nil. Now when we enter preview and tap on the button, I get a view. Or it clears. Without any further ado, let me directly hand it over to Jordi Brun, a fellow indie developer who wants to tell you about some applications of the idea that Stuart just told you about. Hey. My tip is related to using items for presenting full screen overlays. So if you have a Swift UI view and you want to present an overlay, you can do it like this. Just have a state that toggles the, the show overlay and then the button that when you press it, it presents it. And you click on it to dismiss it again, which is pretty simple. Um, but it limits you a little bit. Like if you want to have different full screen overlays, you would have to have different version is this one of this modifier um, so there's a um, actually cleaner way and to do that you need to do a bunch of things um, first you make a an object in this case full screen page um, i start made it as an enum and for the different screens you want to present so let's clean this code up a little bit so <clears throat> the state will be full screen page of type full screen page um, can be an optional because we don't always want to present something and then we adjust this a little bit so we still say um, we still say full screen cover but this time we present it with an item instead of with uh, is presented and then we make a binding to full screen page we don't use on dismiss and 
for the content, we can actually write a short form like this where we basically take whatever full screen page is in the state object and then we present a view that's associated with that. So to make it simple, we can now say full screen page is, for example, blue screen, red screen or green screen. And those are the options here in the enum. And every option in the enum basically is linked to a screen. I just made a bunch of basic screens here with different background colors, but these can be any screen you want in the app. So if I run it now, you'll see that it presents a green screen. But because it's an enum and I made it case iterable, I can also do this now. So I can say full screen page, all cases, page in, and then I can just present the button in there. And I can basically say presents So now it's going to list buttons for all the different ty types. So I can say, show me the green screen, show me the blue screen, show me the red screen. It's something I use a lot in my apps. So for example, in Navi, I have for the different full screen overlays, I have different, um, different ones. Um, yeah, it's super useful. I learned this trick from Stuart Lynch. So watch his uh, videos if you want to learn more of these tricks, because you can also use this for, for example, alerts to make uh, like one alert class for all your alert cases. All right. Apart from showing the power of enums, what this tip really shows is the power of Swift. Swift quickly became my favorite programming language because of its rich feature set, which allows for new ideas even after implementing some similar thing for the 10th time. Speaking of the Swift language, let me hand it over to Antoine van der Lee, the person behind the Swiftly blog. Hello everyone, Antoine here from uh, Swiftly or Swiftly Weekly. You might know me as well from uh, Rocket Sim, and I'm developing apps daily at WeTransfer where we develop multiple applications. I'm here to give you a little tip, and um, the main tip I wanna give today is about staying up to date with Swift that moves incredibly fast, multiple releases every year. So how do you dig into those new features and how do you get the most out of it? What I like to do often, uh, as well for all the articles that I write, I go onto the official Swift blog and I look into what is um, officially released. This is the release page for Swift 5.5. And if you go a bit deeper, you can see that it contains all the Swift evolution proposals that went in this release. And you can dive into the details there. So for example, here you have the one for property rapids. And if you go into that page, there's a lot of details, background stories, detailed design, and so on, um, as well as future directions. And um, the nice thing here is that you can often find um, details about a feature that you weren't aware of that are actually possible in the latest version of Swift. It's kind of like a surprise that you can give to yourself. So yeah, hopefully that helps you a bit in uh, digging into the new features that Swift provides and helps you to um, yeah find awesome new stuff. Enjoy. I think this is one of the best parts about being an iOS developer. There's just so much to explore, even for a veteran. The language constantly evolves and new device features like widgets get added regularly. Let's close this off with one more great tip by Magid from Swift of Magid. Nowadays, we build huge apps that become real opponents to desktop and web apps. Apps contain hundreds of thousands of lines of code and we need to maintain them somehow. I believe that the skill of decomposition is one of the main things every developer should have. The Swift programming language is a great tool allowing you many types of composition like protocol composition, value type composition, etc. Even SwiftUI has been created with view composition in mind. We should learn how to separate concerns and how to compose them together to build and maintain great software. I think Magic brings up a great point here. That's also sort of a summary of all of the other tips that we heard. And this brings us to the end of the video. So here's one last call from me to you. Explore the Swift language, different platforms, packages, and ideas. And most importantly, have fun making your apps.